I'm the president of the Pitt County Historical Society, and on behalf of the Pitt County Historical Society, welcome you to this afternoon's presentation by Dr. Don Inslee. Before we begin the presentation, I'm going to turn the program over briefly to Marlena Rose, who is with Lampus Library, who will be making a few remarks, and then Dr. Todd Savitt will introduce our speaker, Dr. Inslee. Following that, we will be happy to take questions and answers uh, regarding Dr. Inslee's presentation. If you don't mind, please submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen rather than through the chat feature. That will help us to keep track of the questions that have been answered and, and so on. So now, without further ado, and again, thank you for attending this afternoon. Without further ado, here's Marlena Rose. Hi, I'm Marlena Rose, the Assistant Director of Collections and Historical Services here at Lapis Library. And I welcome everybody. Um, we've got Zoom attendees and in-person attendees. For our in-person attendees, I just wanted to invite you guys to, uh, got, we've got some to-go snacks if you like uh, to get one for yourself. And then we've also got a sign-in sheet. Please use the uh, sign-in sheet and add your phone number for contact tracing. And um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Todd Sabat. Thanks. So I'm Todd Savitt from Department of Bioethics and Interdisciplinary Studies at the Brody School of Medicine. I have the honor of introducing my friend and colleague, Dr. Don Ensley. Don Ensley knows a lot of people in Greenville. Somehow, of all those people, I got asked to introduce him to this audience, which is obviously a history-minded group, which fits. I'm a historian of medicine, and the area of research that I do is African Americans in American history. You might say that Don is a living legend in African American medical history here in the East. I first met him and got to know him almost 40 years ago when I moved into his neighborhood in town, Lake Ellsworth. He was already at that time on his way to becoming that living legend. He was prominent at the university for his work on race and medicine in the Department of Community Health. And he was a prominent person in the community for his service work among African Americans and indigent citizens. Our common interests in African American health reached a high point when in 1996, thanks to a grant from the North Carolina Humanities Council and the efforts of Dr. Inslee and also all of his contacts, we were able to record interviews for posterity with four aging physicians who were among the first, if not the first, African-American physicians in their communities. Andrew Best, as many of you know, right here in Greenville, Milton Quigless in Tarboro, Joe Weaver in Ahoskie, and John Hannibal in Kinston, all now deceased. Here's a little bit about Dr. Ensley in a, a formal way. He is Associate Professor Emeritus of the Department of Community Health, now called the Department of Health Services and Information Management of the College of Allied Health Sciences. He has a BA from North Carolina Central University and an MA and a PhD from Michigan State University. He also earned an MPH at UNC Chapel Hill School of Public Health. He joined ECU as one of the first African-American faculty members in 1977. He has served as chair of community health department for a number of years, did serve as chair of community health. His focus in teaching and in service has been on community-based health services, including rural health care, elder care, health care advocacy and sp of special populations, and public health policy. He has served on many boards, 
including the North Carolina Heart Disease and Stroke Task Force and the North Carolina Heart Association. Without taking too much more time, I want to introduce him to you as Don Ensley, the person, rather than as the academic or community activist. First, as I've already said, Don knows everyone, or at least he seems to do. In our neighborhood in Lake Ellsworth, before all the apartments and duplexes and roads got built, when Lake Ellsworth was just a, a bunch of houses off Dickinson Avenue extended, when folks wanted information or something done, they, or we, I was part of that, would say, talk to Ensley. We still say that. Which is to say that Don is, was, and is involved. It's in his nature to find out what's happening in town or at the university. To meet and to know the people making things happen. And to do something. To act. He's easy to talk to. He'll start a conversation with all folks. He'll laugh. He'll empathize. He'll strategize. And he's not afraid to say what he thinks. Forthright is a good word to characterize him, but in a diplomatic and thoughtful way. His focus has always been the black community, and his, goals has, goals, and his goal has always been to do good and to make things better. The title of his talk today is An Eastern North Carolina Journey. And he will, I hope, tell us some of what drives him to achieve this goal of doing good. So join me in welcoming to the podium my friend and colleague, Dr. Donald Ensley. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Savitt. Good afternoon. It is an honor to share with you this journey. There's a lot of you who are participating, uh, for a lot of you who are participating, be it by zone or other technology, help to create such travel. Thanks to Dr. Todd Savitt for introducing me to such great, great participants and for those comments. First, I wish to thank the Pitt County Historical Society, Dr. Tucker, David Denard, the Lopez Library staff, John and Ruth Moscott, and all who made this possible. Thank you. You know, it's very seldom a country boy, an old geezer, geezler, get a chance to have an audience to tell his life story. I'd like for everyone to appreciate the journey as a conversation that we all participate in and not a lecture. This is important for us to sell in to the conversation. I began this journey 80 years ago. Wow. I'm there to my beautiful wife, who is a stroke survivor. And there's a person in the audience who has helped her relative to her aphasia. I've taken care of her for 25 plus years and just recently hired a caretaker. What an adjustment. We have one daughter who we are proud of. She's very independent and have her own Born in Bell Haven, seafood town, farming, and logging. Grew, I grew up in a family of villagers, absent of mother and father. Met my mother and stepfather when I was about 12 years old. Reared by my grandmother, aunt, and the community village. Graduated from public school at the time of all black school in 1959. Remember the U.S. school integration 
came about in 1954. Bell Haven had not caught up yet with that. Limited educational experiences, but an educational environment loaded with love and challenged by teachers and others. And the community village. My grandmother and aunt played major roles in my development. They instilled in me very strong values. The value of obtaining an education at the highest level. They instilled in me strong religious values, faith and belief, and principles of fairness and justice. Freedom was their cornerstone as well as mine, definitely today. These values have been and continue to be my practice throughout this journey. Higher education, once I graduated from high school in 1959, I entered North Carolina College, today North Carolina Central University. Upon graduation with a BA degree in geography and health education, my interest turned to the Peace Corps. Some of you have never heard of the Peace Corps, particularly some of the younger folks that are here today. My first professional job. But there was something else that was awaiting me that I had no idea. It was LBJ, Lyndon Bain Johnson, president of these United States who developed the war on poverty. Instead of going to the Peace Corps, North Carolina received dollars to establish its own approach to fighting poverty under the late Terry Sanford, governor of North Carolina. Me and others ended up training at Duke University as CATS, Community Action Technicians. That's when this community drive, these values, this thing got in me. I couldn't get rid of it. After completing my service obligation, oh, I was, I was uh, uh, also, I went into this army, but after completing my service obligation, I reapplied for graduate school. Michigan State University and was accepted. Michigan State was one of the great schools that my mentor, Dr. Ted Spagner, had recommended. Spagner, who is deceased, was a mentor to countless students throughout the U.S. and the global community. His reputation and love for students is embedded in all of his mentees throughout the global community. At Michigan State, I began to understand things that I had never been uh, approached before relative to a university campus. I was engaged in many scholarly and community activities. The work ethics and values, mentoring and respect for others paid off. Such return as I became the university ombudsman. Coming from Bell Haven, I didn't, couldn't even spell ombudsman. What in the world is ombudsman? Later on, I became assistant director of admission, College of Osteopathic Medicine. What in the world is osteopathy? Bell Haven, osteopathic medicine? I became assistant director of admission, College of Osteopathic Medicine. Then later on, I, as I left, graduated from Michigan State, I came back to North Carolina with a drive that I had never encountered before in my life. I was married, my wife came with me. And I ended up wanting to do an MPH, a post-doctorate degree in public health. One of the problems with this, according to the School of Public Health at that time, they only admitted physicians to do postdoc work. And I said, well, you're going to admit me. If not, we're going to court. 
I was admitted into the School of Public Health at Chapel Hill. But I want you to understand the experience at Michigan State and the values that my parents and others instill in me. The community village preparation helped me on, helped me to continue to develop these skills and to enhance something that I think is so important today, our, my communication skills, my strength, my wisdom, my courage. This preparation periodic will involve me traveling to and from Michigan State, or from Michigan, I kind of got ahead of myself, I said chapter here, but from Michigan to Bell Haven, my hometown. During these travels, I met one of the most committed persons to the cause of humanity, Dr. Andrew Bess. And at the time, the College of Medicine, or the School of Medicine, was beginning to, it was evolving slowly. I met Dr. Jenkins, Ed Monroe, and others. But unbeknown to me at the time, Dr. Bess and Dr. Irons, Marlene Irons, had integrated the practice and acceptance of African-American patients to Pitt Memorial Hospital. We know it now as Vida. I didn't know that. This became a journey that would lead me to the boundaries, borders of Greenville and Eastern North Carolina. How was to know that, the history, that history was being made? with the development of the medical school, the growing of the, the growth of East Carolina University. I didn't know this. But the medical school became one of the areas that grew and grew. Dr. Bess, Ed Monroe, and Chancellor Jenkins carried out what I call today a coup d'etat. They carried out a coup d'etat. As I was saying to a colleague a few minutes ago, there were people and physicians and others in Eastern North Carolina who did not want this to happen. But the late Bill Friday said something that I'll always remember prior to his death, that this was the best thing that ever happened to Eastern North Carolina. But that was our position. When you're a CAT, a community action technician, get ready for the opposition. When you're a community advocate, want to see change and part of that change process, prepare. Because you are going to be attacked and whatnot. But it has to be the right spirit to hold on the fight. That's what's the development of the medical school. I know where, and know where in this I think I could be correct, there are 140 some medical schools, I believe, in the country. But this is the only one where it is legislated to accept minority students and to graduate them. That's in the legislation. A lot of people don't know that. It's in the legislation. Henry, the late, the Henry Fryer, Senator Fryer, Judge Fryer, told Dr. Bess, I cannot support the medical school unless they put that in the legislation. And they did. Today, attempt to honor such are carried out. However, the challenges remain. Pitt County Greenville has been labeled the gateway to the East. I'm not sure what that means to people, especially politicians, public service, community advocates, residents. What does that mean? The gateway to the East. Those persons who live in metropolitan areas, areas that are not growing like Eastern North Carolina, like Pitt County, they know what it means. They mean it's less revenues for Eastern North Carolina, for Pitt County. They mean Easterners, the pirates, so what? They aren't even part of the Atlantic Coast Conference. Uh, Conference. They're ACC, but they're not the Atlantic Coast Conference. But we fight on, that fighting spirit 
not just on this campus, not just East Coast, but out there in the boondocks, out there in the hinterlands, people are fighting to continue to hold on and to provide for the citizens of East and North Carolina. The Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro, Charlotte, and this is real. When we start distributing resources throughout the state, Eastern North Carolina is constantly in battles with those public servants, trying to bring home, as we would call it, the bacon, trying to bring home resources to continue to support and build Eastern North Carolina. Greenville has its own challenges. According to the 2020 census, Greenville grew by only 1%. Therefore, less than stronger growth impact on the growth and development of an area. The gateway to the east. The gateway to the east. On top of that, and the audience know this, those of you who are on, on Zone and other systems, the pan, we got the pandemic, pandemic that's upon us, COVID-19 that's upon us. It is affecting the population of Eastern North Carolina beyond one imagination. Beyond one imagination. Those of you who are practitioners, and all of you are practitioners in your own way. You know, you family practitioners, you nurse practitioners, you doctor practitioners, you just community advocate practitioners. Understand what you or you struggling to understand what you're up against. And the population of Eastern North Carolina, 65% white and 35% African Americans and others. It is a challenge rather, than, rather to, uh, in, in, in terms of responding to these challenges. Because we know that the environment we all live in is a very tense and racist env racial environment now. Division is among us, not only racially, but politically. We know, we know we're up against such, but I would challenge all of you, please dig in, you know, put on the armor, join the war, those of you who are not joined. Today, the estimated vaccine difference between whites and African Americans, or 65% of whites have taken the vaccine, 35% of African Americans have not taken vaccine. You go, why? And that's the major question. Even the U.S. Uh, person, politicians and legislators are asking that question. The pandemic, folks, caught all of us off guard. We don't have a playbook for this. So if you don't have a playbook, what happens? You have to design your playbook. The system that you and I were or trained in, developed in, does not have this curriculum. You have to create your own curriculum. And you have to share that curriculum with others. Now, I'm not saying that the curriculum that you currently engage in, be it academically or otherwise, is not the curriculum. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in addition to the one that you're currently engaged in, design and process or develop another curriculum that you can use to try to get control of what we're up against. This is nothing new. Public health will tell you, and you all know this, historically, we've had viruses and germs and diseases, but this is something that we just weren't prepared for. Healthcare workers are stressed. And I had predicted this, that we are now in court because of the mandates. We are now in court. You haven't seen anything yet in terms of the, the, the different types of court action that's going to be taken against this, particularly the mandates. Families are mentally, physically torn apart. They are physically torn apart. I had someone to personally say to me, 
a couple weeks ago, that they told their child, their daughter, they asked her first, are you vaccinated? And she said, no, don't come over to my house. This is a mother sharing this with her daughter. Don't come over to my house until you're vaccinated. Systems are challenged. The healthcare systems are challenged. The hospital is challenged. As I talked to Dr. Sivanair and others, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, the CEO of Vidan, Michael Walton, I, as I talked with them, we got to get out of our usual mindset and develop a new strategy and a new mindset. Violence is raging across the country and throughout the world that has a correlation relative to this pandemic. You know, it's, it's so I'm, I say all that to say that we are at a point where we can, we can beat this and we will beat it. Uh, but I'm also trying to say that as practitioners, we must employ community strategies to reach communities. Think of a certain cohort out there who do not have access to a computer. It's a lot of them. All they got access, though, I know how to use them. And you're trying to encourage them as a practitioner to be uh, aware and engage in taking the vaccine, even with the booster. And they say, what? What are you talking about? Think of those discussions that have gone on about the Tuskegee experience, eugenesis. We can go on and on. These experiences that populations, particularly African-American populations, have had. Think of those. Why? And then just think about misinformation that's out there. Not just African-American, but others, not African-American. The misinformation is unbelievable. So we are up against all of those factors. But I do believe, in my 80 years of age, we can overcome it. Our teaching, research, lectures, and other educational tools must be redesigned. Must be redesigned. Viruses are here. I'm not a virologist. But viruses are here and will be with us. Get ready and be prepared. A lot of the correlation is with global warming. As someone told me, with the melting of the icebergs and releasing these viruses that have been encased in ice for two and three thousand years. I don't know, but they'll be with us. We'll, they will be with us forever. We must employ community strategies, as I said earlier, to reach communities. As practitioners, our practices have to change. Our practices have to change. We can no longer continue to practice medicine, health care, the way we usually practice it. It has to change. Today is a day of reckoning. It's a day that we recognize that we are people that are in need of information that is going to assist us. We are recognized that we need scientific information that is correct. But it's a day of challenges. I end this by saying that if nothing else, if you don't remember anything else I said, is that my development has been embedded in the values that was taught to me by the village. And when I say the village, I use that openly. A lot of folks. That village is not there anymore. So our young folks and others are relying on us as individuals, not necessarily as villagers, 
should be villagers to help them get through and be part of the success of just living and enjoying this global world that we live in. I challenge all of you to pay attention, not that I have to, to some of the platform information that's going on out of Washington. I am an environmentalist. I pay a lot of attention to what is related to global warming. I think that data and information is relevant to us to continue. And I pay a lot of attention, as Dr. Savitt mentioned, I am community driven, working in communities, and I am driven by trying to make changes in community of color. I am driven by that too. This concludes my conversation. I appreciate all of you taking time out to view and listen to an 80-year-old geezer. Uh, hopefully a person with some wisdom that may be used by the community of humanity. Thank you. signed in to please sign in with your phone number we're doing contact tracing just in case there's contact tracing needed and we've got snacks for you as well I'll hand it over to John. okay now for the Q&A session and uh, we, will, we will first of all privilege the uh, the in-person audience that's here and then we will take Q&A from the online um, viewers so now I'm going to turn it over to Lane Carpenter who will moderate the Q&A session if you don't mind Thanks. thank you very much um, I'm going to adjust something in the Zoom really quick, but I will. Um, I saw one question out in the audience, so I'll let someone ask that while I'm doing fixing this. <laughs> so, Dr. Inslee, the title of the talk is a journey, and I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about the journey when you returned from Michigan to Eastern North Carolina. Um, and what you found, what barriers you encountered, what help you encountered, um, particularly perhaps here at ECU when you were early in your career and we did not have many African Americans on uh, faculty here. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that part of your journey. Well, I... I appreciate that question. Uh, coming from Bellhaven, a uh, rural community, as some of you know, uh, you, 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 you are spiritually, if I may use that, or led or you're influenced by people, my teachers who really influenced me to work hard, and I knew that my uh, trying to to do things were somewhat limited because of my skills, like uh. So when I got to North Carolina Central University, I realized my deficits and work hard to overcome that. So I, I'm trying to say my work ethics helped me too, but. Uh, after the Army draft me, I didn't say this, at 25 during the Vietnam War, uh, they wanted me to pursue a lieutenant. And I said, no, y'all send me home in a body bag. Uh, it was some, and I got to find out who made this statement, but, well, I won't make that statement on there. But anyway, so I uh, got that experience, went to Germany, uh, and Michigan State, I had applied to Michigan State, and reapplied, and Michigan State said, yes, come on. And so I ended up pursuing my, uh, first my master's in social geography, or medical geography, uh, which kind of got me into epidemiology. 
And then me moving around and with my personality, the president of Michigan State, Clifton Wharton, said, I want you to go over to the College of Osteopathic Medicine as assistant director of admission. My intention was to go to law school at Ann Arbor because working in Charlotte, I had worked with a lot of young men who had gotten into trouble and was in jail. They thought I was a lawyer, but that was my intention. But after talking with the president of Michigan State, one of the first African-Americans to be hired at a Midwestern uh, university at that level, he said, well, we'll help you get into a PhD program, da-da-da-da-da-da, uh, I went. But I guess trying to answer your question, the Michigan State experience relative to academic climate university helped me as I came to Greenville to kind of adjust to that academic environment here at East Carolina University. And when I came and interacted with Dr. Bess, well, something else. I applied as assistant director for the School of Medicine, College of Medicine. You might remember that. And uh, Dr. Metcalf beat me out. I was a young, brass person, and I think that scared Dr. Loftus. <laughs> Say, I'm not sure we want to hire this guy. <laughs> and so, uh, Don Dancy was chair of the Department of Community Health, and I think Ed Monroe, I don't know this for a fact, but I think Ed Monroe said, we need to keep this guy. And that's how I ended up in the School of Allied Health Sciences. But, uh, yeah, but I'm, I've, thir you know, 33 years here. Uh, David is sitting in the back. We know we worked together for quite a while and creating the black faculty and staff group uh, the research that you mentioned, uh, and I think students, particularly African American students, saw us and saw me and others and wanted to come. Uh, and I was also doing not a lot of work in the medical school to promote the matriculation of students into medicine, but they heard of me, and so some did come. So yeah. Are there any other questions from the audience here today? Um, so when you returned to Greenville, what were some of the community-based projects that really hit home and, and took off when you got back from Michigan? Mm -hmm. If you remember. You, oh, <laughs> oh you didn't yeah. hear? Yeah, then I can hear you better. When you returned from Michigan, mm -hmm. what were some of the community, you know, public health kind of uh, big projects that really hit off when mm -hmm. you returned? Okay, good question. Well, the, the obvious one was community health education, working with uh, particularly the blighted communities or community of color who needed to understand better what was going on relative to their disease process, particularly high blood pressure, obesity, those what we call the social determinants of health now, those kinds of things. And, and not just educating them, but engage. Something I didn't say today is very important. Engaging them and to assist themselves in trying to minimize or eradicate those illnesses and whatnot. I think as practitioners, and that's okay, we want to go out and do it and get it over with or say, hey, this is what I've done. Well, in my training as a CAT, Community Action Technician, one of the threads, strong threads of that training was assist the community in becoming independent so they can do for themselves. Because you aren't gonna always be there. You got to help them with their skills. And so, so it was some of the public health. The other thing was uh, assisting them in how to articulate or go before audiences and share their concerns and relative to health. And then what I found out that it just wasn't health that they were concerned about. They were concerned about just, just like that, basic survival. I'll never forget, and you didn't ask this, but you triggered something. Uh, 
working with the American Heart Association for about 10 or 12 years, um, I was concerned that it didn't have more people who looked like me that were on the Heart Council board. And I was in Chicago and we were meeting, I was running my mouth as usual about what can we do to get more African Americans and others involved. And I never forget this older African American lady got up, walked over to the table, <coughs> excuse me, where we were. She said, young man, let me tell you what volunteerism is. I said, yes ma'am. She said, back in the day, all days, when a person in the community had to go to work, didn't get a chance to breastfeed their child, bring it over and I'll breastfeed it. So she said, on one breast I might have my own child, on the other breast I might have somebody else's child. That's volunteerism. I shut my mouth then. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine it? Feeding somebody you don't even know the child? But that's the kind of experiences. And, and I'm, I use that to try to make a point. But those are the kinds of experiences that we have in these communities that are mind boggling. They don't teach that in school. No, they don't teach that. And some of it is by experience, you have to experience. Always want to continue to learn and be exposed. Always keep that open. I, at my age, I'm still learning. And I'm still trying to learn. It takes a while to mind don't work like it used to. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. I'm going to ask a question okay. in the chat now. Okay. Uh, this is a longer question, so if you need me to repeat okay. um, at different points, just let me know. Uh, he asks, well, he says, I would benefit from your thoughts about our struggles with attempting to communicate with all our culture effectively particularly the 35% of our African-American and other minority communities. This COVID pandemic has again exposed significant disability to communicate in a trustworthy and effective manner. Do we need to need a different but specific organizational approach? How can we work past this communication hurdle once and for all? <laughs> That's a major question and <laughs> I wish I had the answer uh, that's what I was trying to make reference to is that we got to have a new mindset and uh, we use that term in our academic community a new mindset what does that mean uh, for me it's mean rethinking how we approach uh, trying to address the issues of diseases address the issues of racial division address the issues of you know what's causing and what are the cause of factors uh, and if we use the same models, that's what I'm trying to get at, if we continue to use the same models that we're using, well, as I'm concerned, it's, it's, they aren't working. I mean, I listen to some of the CDC folks, and they're great, but if you are communicating information, and some of them do attempt to communicate information to communities of color and other, the language they use, some of it I don't even understand. But I'm saying, wait a minute, either you get someone who can take that language and put it in a, you know, in, in understandable, acceptable, whatever, so people can understand it. Now, you know and I know, even today, uh, what is being said is that it's so much confusion definitely coming from the Biden's administration on the booster. People just so confused. So I'm not blaming anybody. We all are going through a lot of perplexities and confusion about this vaccination or vaccine. So we got, to, I think we got to rethink the way we do business in the marketplace. And, and that's not easy. Uh, working with some of you guys over here, I would think that uh, if you don't have, and I'll get in trouble for saying this, but if you don't have a professor type who's creative, uh, independent thinker and can think outside the box, you're in trouble. Because it is, and it's safe for, for some to stay in, as we say, in your lane, and it's, it's safe. But to step out of that safety and introduce 
not necessarily theories, but practices. That's not easy to do. Why liability, particularly those of you who are involved in direct treatment? Liability, that's, that's tough. Others that are not involved in practices, uh, medical practice or whatever, uh, it's a chance you have to take. Now, when I go into the community and have a conversation with some of the persons out there, groups and whatnot, they'll stop me. Wait a minute, Don, what are you talking about? Uh, and then they give me reasons. People giving, and, and let me say this, people are scared. Fear is unbelievable now. You can slice it, fear. <laughs> As I shared with a friend of mine, fear is basic, it's normal. Animals, we're animals, hopefully of the higher order. But fear is something that is, it just totally takes away any kinds of thinking, action and whatnot. But you have to break through the fear, now, don't get me wrong. I'm no fool now. I'm not gonna step in a hole or minefield that I know got a mind in it. But I'll walk around that and figure out a way how I can get that mind out of that hole. So yeah, so fear is one, one thing that's upon us too. Uh, but I think we can, we'll overcome it. I didn't mean to be so long on that one, but. Just one question. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions from in here? Dr. Ansley, uh, my question uh, follows a little on uh, something that uh, uh, Dr. Savitt uh, mentioned uh, when he asked you about your return uh, from Michigan. You, know, uh, you had come from this area, you had gone to Michigan, and you returned apparently with some tools uh, to change this area. How much change would you say uh, you made possible after your return from Michigan? In other words, uh, I'm looking at it like a, a historian. Uh, I'm a southerner. I came here from Georgia, deep south, okay? I entered North Carolina by way of Fayetteville, okay? Then I decided to come east, about 106 miles east of, uh, uh, northeast of Fayetteville. Someone told me there that you were going into another country, culturally and otherwise. And I have learned from the landscape, from the people, for most part, that uh, uh, we're still uh, uh, kind of enmeshed in some of the old South, not the new South. Now, when you return from Michigan, you know, up north, those kind of skill sets, how did you find uh, your way around uh, this area and what impact did you have as a change agent? We're talking about uh, uh, this med school and uh, Sir Leo Jenkins and what he did and the opposition that he faced, the opposition you faced. So what did you bring back from Michigan and how did it mesh uh, with this area that would allow you to say, well, this is what I helped to change this is what I helped to change. Uh, that's what I would like for you, just the impact, you know, uh, that you had uh, on uh, this uh, uh, community, this region, mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. I, I would, thank you, Dr. Denard, and I would say facetiously, Dr. Tucker said you need to invite Inslee back again so I can answer your question, because that's, <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Uh, I can't quantify as such, uh, but this is a conversation that Todd and you and I have been in over time. 
um, in terms of maybe what changes that I might have brought back from Michigan and empl uh, employ to, to create change? One, two, what changes have I seen occur? And maybe three, uh, and I don't know if you couch it this way, but three, what the future changes might be. Uh, let, me, let me try to answer it this way. Um, I recognize coming back to Eastern North Carolina as a Southern, as you said, that there were certain cultures that I had to acknowledge and adhere to. Uh, one of the cultures is you be quiet and listen and don't say anything. i never forget uh, my wife and I, when we first got back here, I was at a store buying some uh, flowers or something, and this, this white male asked me, he said, who's your father? And I went, excuse me? Those are experiences that I had, and, but I understood instead of me wanting to say, what in the, you know, why you want to know, I just said, dismissed it. Uh, but I, I would say, Dr. Denard, that the changes, if you call them changes, that I try to, as well as you and others, have tried to employ has not been easy. But we have seen changes. If Leo Jenkins, Dr. Bess, and Ed Monroe had listened to some of the practitioners, even the practitioners that are out here practicing medicine, we probably would have never had this medical school. So what I'm trying to say is the change, as a change agent, as a change force, you have to be ready to accept the fact that you're up against not only cultures, you're up against rules and regulations, uh, just like some of the people acting out now, they say, it's my constitutional right not to be uh, required to be vaccinated. So people use these tools to say, you can't make me, and if you do, I'm going to take you to court. You know, but it's my constitutional right. And you go, yes, but the outcome is death if you don't <laughs> you know, adhere to this. Maybe some of them understand it, maybe some of them don't, and maybe some selfishly say, I don't care. You know. But I, I say all that to say is that change, and I can't quantify it, has occurred in East or North Carolina. If not, I wouldn't be standing here today. No way. If not, the audience, you guys, wouldn't be there. So I'm a realist to know that some change, maybe not at the rate that I want it to, be, to, to occur, but some changes have occurred. Yes, as I said, the medical school, no, they have not. The dental school, School of Allied Health Sciences, you know, our, our you know, major colleges, hey, it's a lot of work to do. Have a lot of work to do. To bring, to go, but to go out, but now the, the work is preparation. Think of our schools now. Now, forget about the, the struggle that they're having with the pandemics. But think about just Eastern North Carolina schools trying to hire competent teachers to teach in these schools to prepare our kids for this technological world. They ain't coming to Eastern North Carolina. They're going to Raleigh. They're going to, to Charlotte. This is the thing we're up against. A lot of them aren't going to Fayetteville, even Southeast. But this is what we're up against, folks. Losing population, our population in East North Carolina is aging. Young folks, before they can get their high school <laughs> diploma, and, and maybe some of them decide to come to ECU, they're out of here. They're gone. So we have a population in East and North Carolina, unfortunately, that's aging, where you lose a young folk. Pitt County Gramer probably is the only county, besides Dare County, Dare County is very 
<laughs> uh, wealthy county because all the retirees and others. But when you start thinking about and cluster the counties, when you start thinking about Pitt County, Pitt County is probably one of the more, uh, I won't say progressive, <laughs> but one of the counties that at least have active activities to give it a chance to be uh, a, an environment that people want to come to. But outside of Pitt County, you're 35 miles out. You go into my county, Beaufort County, it's, I, I, it's sad. Growth, growth, 1%, we've got to have growth and development. So what I'm trying to say, Dr. Denard, some of the things that you describe uh, are things that impact on the culture, racial makeup, employment, housing, all of those things that are part of what we call the, the, the just social determinants of health or the existence of people that have to have. And we're struggling in Pitt County for such. Uh, we just need all of you to put your, as they say, coming from Oprah County Bell Haven, put your soul to the plow. Uh, probably didn't ask you directly, but I tried. <laughs> but that's, that's gonna be. Um, our next question comes from one of our online um, attendees. It is, do you have any ideas how the Vidant Health System can expand its assistance and direction to assist many of the communities of color in receiving a better quality of health care? That's a tough one. <laughs> well, I call it the system. Uh, Vidan is a major system in Eastern North Carolina. I think there are eight or nine hospitals under this corporate entity, this corporate design that they have. Uh, I think some of you, some of the people that are, that are on Zoom, know about the dilemma that Bell Haven had with losing Pungo District Hospital uh, and how people rally around trying to save their hospital there. I would say that Vidant, under the leadership, uh, the staff and others, uh, is struggling to provide services, not only health services, but services. They employ people, et cetera, et cetera, in Eastern North Carolina. However, I would also say that the environment that they're in is very competitive. Hospitals across this country, some of them are fighting just to keep the doors open. And let me say this, particularly your community hospitals, your rural hospitals, I was just reading the other day, a lot of rural hospitals are just, I mean, they're in Tiramar. Because those rural hospitals, they're the first line, in a lot of cases, for the people in their communities. And a lot of the rural hospitals just can't survive because of this challenge, COVID-19 and other factors. So we're going to be saying, how can we save or assist our rural hospitals. So your community hospitals came about in 1965 are really trying to stay apprised, of, uh, uh, I mean, trying to stay above water, so to speak. The hospital practices today, again, are not necessarily practices that require some of the tools and approaches that I'm talking about. These are medical centers that have direct application and whatnot. So what I'm trying to do, I'm glad you asked the question, is convince Dr. Walston, Walston, Walton, thank you, I, <laughs> Walton, to develop an office called community engagement. I did. I feel that share this with you. While I was here, for a quick second, I was a system vice chancellor for community engagement <laughs> here at ECU. 
So that's another experience I had in trying to engage the communities. But anyway, that's where we are in this discussion. Uh, that's the ombudsman experience I have. Uh, so I'm trying to share it with him that there's a need for all, for that system to have a community engagement office, a component that would have some of these tools that I try to share with you today. Uh, where that's going, I don't know. But Vidant, that corporate system has to be much more engaged in these communities. Uh, not just providing hospital care, but providing community assistance that, it, that are needed for people in their community. So uh, that's, that's the challenge we have. I see another question in here. So, do you think it's better for us to take the existing system and tear it apart and redesign it, or throw it away and start a new system? What would be more effective in making change? Because <laughs> you said something that is so critically, like a key word. You said that Vident Corporation is, you, mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. It needs to uh, mm -hmm. implement more community engagement, but Vidant Corporation is not set up for community engagement. They're all about the money. So, and community t costs a lot of money. So, what do you think is more effective? I know it's a million dollar question, or a loaded, loaded question, but I mean, what, what are your thoughts? Well, <laughs> I, <laughs> you like Dr. Denard, you got me out here in deep water now. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's something I said earlier, I, and I'm not scapegoating on this, I, I'm going to try to ask you the best I can. The systems, and I'm talking about the hospital, the universities, even our churches, uh, and other systems, or synagogues, or other system, have to, that's what I'm saying, now I know it's a broad thing, have to rethink, redesign our approach to doing business in the marketplace, uh, in our communities. That's frightening for systems. Systems are designed to do just something you said, to generate revenue, okay? Uh, some systems don't do that. They're designed for humanity purposes. Uh, some systems are designed to assist people and to enhance in their, you know. But a lot of systems are designed, such as hospital systems, not just my dad, but hospital systems, designed to create revenue. Now, recognizing that, I'm saying the revenue that you could create, you can use some of that revenue to create these innovative approaches. I'm not against, don't get me wrong, I, I think the way our US system and country is set up, I'm not against marketing strategies or marketing or producing, no. But I, I do have problems with us using our market system to uh, impact on the lives of people in a negative way. You know, I have problems with that. But I think they can rediscover and redesign. That's what I'm trying to say. I think Vidan or any other hospital or any other system need to reassess their roles in the communities. Get some of those people that live in these communities on these boards or on these committees. Listen to them. Don't just get a darn insulin. Get some of these people that the other boards and committees they're going to help them to grow and develop their skills. You'd be surprised the number of people walking in the streets got skills that'll blow your mind. 
but they never had an opportunity to demonstrate those skills because we have structured our systems to respond to only those persons who adhere to what our designs are. You know. So I'm not, I'm not one to say you dismantle and throw it out. No, uh, I'm not one to. Now there are some people who believe that and some people are trying that, by the way. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But I think what we have currently has, an, has is designed, well, is functioning in a way we can assess them with their dysfunction if they'll listen. That's the piece. If they would listen and then engage. But when you got a system that's just bent on generating capital, but you, as a change agent, you have to accept that first and understand it and say, here I come. I'm coming at you. I think you are. I can tell. Two more questions in the <laughs> chat, so I'm gonna, because yeah. people are asking to hear the question. Um, let me find it. Where did it go? All right, this question is, oh, wait. I'm gonna go to the chat, <laughs> sorry. person um, says, Dr. Inslee, with all your knowledge and being from Beaufort County, can a small town like Aurora, North Carolina be revived? Mm. 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 Boy, that's a tough one. First of all, I think the small town has to want to be revived first. Uh, I think something is basic to all of this. You can call them strategies, whatever you want to call them. You have to want to change. Change just doesn't happen. You got to want to change. A small town like Belhaven can change. But now let me share something. Um, some of my geography comes to play now. Belhaven, there's a lot of Belhavens out there. As I said earlier, these small Bantu lands are losing populations. There ended up being areas of older populations. So the question is, how do you rev uh, revitalize an area where the population is dwindling? It might mean, I've said it might mean that some of these small areas are going to have to look at a redesign of their divisions or connection to other small towns. It's a term for that. I'm forgetting it right now. Uh, but the other thing, to number two, that's creating a problem is the cost of keeping these towns function. You know, lights, water, uh, Healthcare systems is costly. And as I said earlier, your Mecklenburg, your Wake counties, your Guilford counties, they're saying, hey, don't don't even they don't need no money in eastern North Carolina. I mean that's an attitude. Even among the law, the, the public, I mean the uh, the people who design in the laws, public service and politicians. So you start thinking about why would I, or why would we encourage Bell Haven, small town Bell Haven, to continue to hold on when holding on is, is costing us money? I think, that, excuse me, these are basic questions that's going to have to be addressed in the future, and maybe right now. Uh, but it's, it's a tough one. The other thing, trying to find persons in these small towns that are engaged is not easy. 
Right now, folks, people are fighting to just stay alive. I never forget <laughs> during an administration, and I'm not going to call the administration name, but one of our presidents was in this city giving a talk, and he said, people need to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. And this lady way back there said, how can I do that when I don't have any boots? And that stuck with me. How can we encourage people to be engaged when their tummies are grabbing, when their rent is not being paid, when they're trying to get their, their kids to school? Or they don't have a computer for the kids to come home and work on the computer, work on their, their lesson and whatnot. It's tough. It's tough. So you get somebody like me, a CAT, community action technician out there, trying to advocate for change. They say, why are you encouraging me to change for? I got to survive to put food on my table for my kids. You go, oh my God, they didn't teach me that at Duke that I had to be ready to respond to that. How do I respond to it? That's real, right now. When those of us who want to go out there say, look, your attitude about this vaccine, you need to change that attitude. Because the bottom line is death. Somebody said, well, maybe that's the best thing that can happen to me. That's out there. You go, huh? Maybe that's the best thing that can happen to me. Under this circumstance of what I'm dealing with, maybe death is what can happen to me. So it's not easy. I stand before you today to say I don't have the answers. But I'm trying to encourage people to seek those answers or seek whatever engagement that you can be in to make a difference. And after 30 some years, hopefully my comments today being recorded by the Pick Out Historical Society might have some impact on the change process in eastern North Carolina. I'm not just concerned about Pitt County Green, but I'm concerned about eastern North Carolina. You know. You mentioned the proportion of African American population in Eastern North Carolina who'd been vaccinated, I believe, during your talk. Mm -hmm. This person wants to know um, if this community is receiving the needed information and care um, about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did mention that, and I think that's a question a lot of folks are asking. Uh, the practitioners, those who are practicing others, and just basic question is if their communities are really receiving information that would encourage vaccination. And as I said earlier, unfortunately, the confusion is going on even in Washington relative to the booster shots. Who's to get the booster? What age should get the booster? Pregnant mothers, whether they should get the uh, shot, you know, how that might infect the unborn. All these are crash basic questions that are going on whirling around us throughout, and not just in U.S., global, very quickly. And, and I'll try to, again, come back to that question. Globally, there are certain countries in this, on, this, in this, on this planet they have not gotten any vaccine at all, at all. Now, the president the other day, based upon CNN, I don't believe everything CNN said, is that we were shipping our X number of vaccines to different countries. Well, for example, there are certain countries in, uh, in Africa that haven't received any vaccine, you know. There are certain countries in India 
Pakistan and other places. No. And some of the vaccine is being produced in Pakistan. Some of the drugs. So you can go on and on. So this is a very, very complex problem we have. But I, my, my, my wisdom, if you call it that, we can work through it. But we got to create a different mindset. And we can't continue to use the same old mindset. That's why I was saying curriculums have to undergo some changes. So students and practitioners and others can start learning and practicing those skills that are needed. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I'm over, sorry, I kind of forgot. Did I? Question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, how did the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. influence your education, pursuits, and advocacy for marginalized people of color? Well, the obvious is uh, Martin Luther King, um, others, uh, John Lewis, make good trouble, John used to say. Uh, I mean, all of them had an impact on my life during this cycle or during the lifetime I was growing and developing. Uh, I'm not a pacifist. I want to make that clear. I think some of my statements, you all, you, you know. However, I have, because of my value system, I have high respect for people. And, and as I tell my daughter, you, could, you have to give respect in order to demand respect. Uh, however, uh, the teaching of nonviolence, uh, I wasn't one that could work, walk on the picket lines. I remember, David remembered this, I shared it with him. At Central, I was trying to do what other college students did, and I got on the picket line and did something stupid. They sent me back. So you go back and make the signs, because you... You, you aren't the kind of person that, that we need out here. Uh, but the teaching of Martin as well as of Gandhi, uh, all of them has been part of my value system. Uh, but I read a lot. I read Malcolm, continue to read Malcolm, some of his stuff and uh, literature and stuff. Uh, so I read, I read, and I learned from A to Z. I mean, uh, so a lot, of, a lot what has helped me, not only my attempt to practice, but my exposure to a lot of different readers, researchers, uh, and others. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, Dr. Johnson, my surrogate brother, uh, who's at Chapel Hill now, School of Business, they just released, and I have to give that to Dr. Tucker, uh, a paper on the uh, impact of the COVID on blighted communities. They actually did interviews of people in these blighted communities to get their impact. Now that's a research uh, exercise that they've been involved in, probably will be published. That's the other thing for some of you who like to publish and write. Uh, this is the time. But remember this. In this continuum of life, on one end of the continuum, this pandemic is making systems rich. On the other end of the continuum, this pandemic, people are dying. That's the way systems unfold. That's the way life unfolds. You know, your drug companies now, they are fighting to see who can get out the first drug to actually eliminate this. Whoever comes first, whoever comes in first, they're the ones going to get the big pot, the money. So competition, and competition is good, don't get me wrong. But I want you, I'm trying to say, try to understand all of the dynamics that are going on 
and the process of life and how it impacts on you as an individual, but also on groups and others who are trying to survive as well. That's what I'm trying to get at. Rethinking the process, taking chances, you know, walking the plank, you know, taking chances. And that's what life is all about. Thanks a lot for listening. And yeah. Yes. for agreeing to co-sponsor this host this afternoon. Uh, we, uh, we're very happy to have had this space and the technical assistance that, uh, that comes with it. Also, Lane Carpenter for moderating the question and answer period that followed the, the talk. Uh, Dr. Sabbath for introducing our main speaker. But certainly, most of all, mm -hmm. my heartfelt th thanks to Dr. Inslee for an excellent thought-provoking presentation that uh, that I think was from the heart as much as anything and we yeah. can't thank you enough uh, and for all of you out there in uh, virtual land we thank you for attending this for the audience that we have here thank you for being here this afternoon and with that said we will bring this to a conclusion thank you. Oh. okay